So if the question here for both of these is graph, because right now we're focused on um, stationary points and points of inflection, what they will do is they will craft the question such that it has a certain number of stationary points or a certain kind of inflection point, all that kind of thing. Um, one of the interesting things, which uh, takes, takes some genuine thought, it took me quite a few years after I started teaching to realize this, is that if you craft a question because of the nature of differentiation, if you craft a question so it's got nice stationary points, then almost always you will have messy intercepts or vice versa. If you have um, anything of complexity, like not a parabola basically, if you have nice intercepts, then your stationary points will be at weird, awkward spots, which is what happens with this, okay? Uh, yeah, so we're going to have nice, st I, I suspect these coefficients have been chosen to make the stationary points easy to find, whereas the, if you have a look, like how am I supposed to factorize this to get the x-intercepts? And it's like, well, there's not a nice pairing of things and it's just uh, gross, right? And of course, we don't really have tools um, to deal with a degree of uh, power four. So yeah, but that's okay. We can still, we can still do a lot. So the first thing to notice is um, I can, this is gonna be a, a, a quartic curve. So we know um, a parabola looks something like that, right? A qubit looks something like that. You can see a parabola has a power of two, which gives it one stationary point. Because if it has a power of two, its derivative has a power of one. Does that make sense? So therefore, one stationary point. This is a cubic with power three. So therefore, its derivative has a power of two, which is why we often find, not every time, because you, you can have this guy, right? But we, we often find two stationary points. Therefore, logic sort of, if you follow along, right? If you have a quartic, then its derivative will have a power of three, which is why you can expect that there will be one or two or three stationary points. Just like this, you can have combinations. So for example, you could have one that looks like this. So you can have a stationary point there, and then you have a horizontal point of inflection there. Uh, so we have different combinations, so we'll find out once we start to get to work, okay? So, uh, we, we need to find all these features. So let's, let's differentiate. That gives us this. What do we get? 4x cubed, help me out with the rest of it. You're going to get uh, minus uh, 48. 48? I think so, 48. I think it's 48. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, squared plus 144. Cool. And uh, that's all you get. Yeah. Yep. All right, good. So. Uh, before I get to uh, like test this and all that kind of thing, while I'm in a differentiating mood, I might as well do the second derivative. Now, I'm doing this so that I can determine nature. Why did I use the second derivative test and not the first derivative? For the nature. Yeah, like I'm going to use this in a second to find out the nature of the stationary points. Why did I choose to go second derivative rather than first? Uh, yeah, they do. <laughs> I've written them messily. Um, the main reason why, if you think about that big enormous flow chart I drew before, the main reason why I choose second derivative rather than first derivative is because this is very easy to differentiate. Like polynomials are super easy. Uh, later on, like when, if you deal with something like this, yeah. I do not want to differentiate that again. I'll do it once because I have to find stationary points, but I'm going to avoid doing it twice like the plague. Okay? So I will differentiate this again. That gives me 12x squared take away 96x yeah. plus 144. Oh, okay, so now let's work with these things. Um, this, this first derivative here, um, I've got a whole bunch of common factors, right? In fact, I can see that 4x is a common factor. What does that leave behind? x squared take away 12x plus 30, 30, 144 divided by 4. Wait, wait, no, come on, we can do this. Is it 30? It's 36, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. Okay, um, <laughs> flex your numerical muscles, it's healthy for you, okay? Because um, also, like, that's how you spot errors more quickly. Because if you think about this when you're checking back to a paper, you don't usually check with a calculator, you're just looking at the numbers, you're like, oh, does it look about right? And if you don't have the mental rigor to be able to say, wait a second, that's not right, you know, it's just a useful thing to do. Um, having done this, we can factorize further, can't we? Because 36, this is a perfect, square, isn't it? So in fact, it's 4x outside of x minus 6. All square. Okay. 
which makes me suspicious. All right, let's, ha let's have a look at this. So therefore, um, I'm not going to worry too much about my working here because the question is graph. So the primary thing I'm producing is the graph. And all this working is just subsidiary. They're not really going to mark my working. They're going to mark my graph. So therefore, I'm going to play a bit fast and loose with things. So if I want stationary points, I'll abbreviate that because I'm just in a hurry, right? And I'm not worried about the working. Then they exist when the first derivative is, is 0, right? Which is when x equals So when x equals 0, that's convenient because that was, that's going to give me the y-intercept anyway. Uh, when x equals 0, y is going to be 0, 0, 0, 10. OK, this one, <laughs> let's use our calculators. Uh, when x equals 6, on the other hand, we're going to have uh, yeah, six, 6 cubed is already 216. So 6 to the power of 4 is 1,296 minus my brain is already melted by now, so I have no idea. That's fine. Four forty-two. Okay, so fine. It's a big number, but that's okay. We'll just adjust our scale accordingly. Okay. So I notice that both stationary points. They're both uh, for positive values of y. So most of the stuff is happening above the x-axis. So let's just draw a very rough sort of um, thing here. So when x equals 0, y equals 10. But when x equals 6, y equals 442. That thing's huge. So I'm going to put some markers here. Uh, let's call this 100, 200, 300, 400. 500, right, in order to get to there. So when x equals 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I'm somewhere in between 400 and 500. So let's call that over here. It's not very scale. <laughs> uh, well, well, it's not, the x and y ac axes are not the same scale, but they don't need to be. So I I'm OK with that. So if this is 400, and this is 500, and this is x equals 6, then that point there is 10, 4, 4, sorry, 6, 442. 4, 6, 442. 4, okay? And of course, I also have my y-intercept here, so that's going to be way down here at 10. OK, how are we looking so far? Okay. Now, um, at this point, I, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that because this is a polynomial, I know a lot about how polynomials work. For instance, you know with the parabola, right? Parabolas are either concave up or concave down. How can you tell really quickly in, in a single look which one it is? Uh, well, okay, you can go to calculus, but there's a quicker way. Yeah, you're, you're looking for the coefficient. We call it the leading coefficient. It's the coefficient attached to the biggest power of x, right? Now, if, of course, this was a quadratic, then the biggest power of x would be 2. So you'd say, oh, plus 72, so I'm concave up, right? Now, it's the same deal for any, any kind of polynomial, right? So if you think of x to the 4, you can see there's uh, quartics, which are basically going up, and then there are quartics, which are basically going down, OK? And you can't, uh, you, you can't have both, right? In order to have both like up and down, you need an odd polynomial. That's because of this. Think about when you put large values into here, right? When you put large values of x into here, this guy becomes a huge positive number, which basically dwarfs everything else that's happening here. Even though you're like, x cubed, that's still going to be big. But next to x to the 4, it's like a grasshopper, OK? When you put in negative values of x, very large ones, what's this guy doing? It's still going to be a large positive number, large positive, right? On the other hand, if I were to slap a minus sign out the front, you're going to get this situation because it's going to be negative times a positive number and negative times a positive number, whichever way you go. Okay? Now, because it's positive, I know it's going to look like one of these, like that. So when I have a look at this, right? remember, I've got to come from the top down, and then I've got to go up. So I actually already have an educated guess as to what kind of stationary points these are. Right? I'm guessing that that's a minimum. I'm guessing that's a horizontal point of inflection. It can't turn around, because then it would end up down here. So I'm going to use my second derivative to confirm that. Okay? Let's have a look. When x equals 0, that's our first stationary point. Right? You can look at this very quickly. Right? When x equals 0, what is the sign of the second derivative? Yeah, the number is 144, which is positive. Right? So this one is concave up. 
Does that make sense? When you put in x equals 6, 12 times 36 minus 96 times, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I would put some money down that it's 0. Is it 0? Yep. Bam. Okay. Now, keep in mind, um, concavity 0 can look like this, or it can look like that, or it can look like that. But the point is that it's straight. However, I also know it's a stationary point. That means it's got a horizontal tangent. So this is what's happening. Right, for that little spot there. Okay, so that just confirms. If I had to, um, if I if I had multiple parts of this, and like the first part of the question before you graph was find the stationary points and determine their nature. This doesn't cut it. I've got to go further. Right, I haven't proven, for instance, that this is a horizontal point of inflection. I need to know that there's a change in concavity on both sides. I haven't established that, but I I know enough clues about this that I can just go for it. That's really all the information that I need. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw it like this. There we go. I'm done. OK. Which, by the way, uh, because this is a minimum, right? Because this is a minimum, it's concave up, right? Uh, that's why there are actually no ex intercepts. That's why we were looking at like, oh, how are we going to find that, right? Um, so there aren't any exodicepts. So that's a shape. OK. So just to rewind, like just to review, what did we do? Well, we, do, we differentiated. We knew we had to do that. Find your stationary points, determine their nature, um, and then fit it together in a picture that makes sense of the features that you've got. OK? If, didn't know what, like, if I had no idea, you yep. You would have to find the nature of like all the sides of the point. Or if I really didn't know very much, I would actually probably go back to the first derivative and I'd draw up a table of values. Because the table of values that I would get, I would get some numbers that tell me this. Like I would get negative gradient, 0, positive gradient, 0, positive gradient again. And that quite accurately tells me what's going on. I know it's a continuous curve. It's just a polynomial. There's no values of x that break it down. There's no denominator. So I know I'm going to get a smooth curve of some kind. And the only one that fits this looks like that. Okay.